Hi, everyone. Welcome to, to the session. Um, just as a, as a way of starting, as of late September anyway, there was half a billion dollars of uh, venture capital invested in quantum computing so far this year. Just this week, I saw that uh, a company called IQM raised 39 million euros more Series A funding. Um, and the prize here is big, as almost every one of us knows. Uh, Boston Consulting has it that uh, quantum computers will improve bottom lines uh, of their users between $450 billion and $850 billion by 2050. But, um, and this is where I'll start with the, the, the provocative part, uh, the whole enterprise is, is based on hardware that largely doesn't exist and software to, to run on it that is of largely unknown scope. Um, now, not everyone here on the panel invests in both hardware and software. We will come to those <clears throat> separately. But um, I think it's clear that finding algorithms that are commercially useful and simple enough to work with the kit that we have now is not at all straightforward. Um, and most provocatively, I would say, uh, remind everyone that the National Academy of Sciences last year reported that there are no commercial applications known to exist. So I know that that will spark some thoughts in the panelists. Um, so I will run, uh, run through who's here on the panel. Um, Andrew Shun is a principal at NEA. Uh, Margaret Wu is a lead investor for Georgian Partners, Tomer Diari, uh, VP at Bessemer Venture Partners, and T Thomas Daluin, uh, Managing Partner at Airbus Ventures. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Jason. Hi, Jason. Um, I will start with um, uh, uh, quite a, a basic one, I think, that will get us into some of the uh, some of the core issues that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I think the, the, the most basic question is, is now the time for venture capital in the quantum computing space? Um, let's start, say, with, with Margaret. Um, I think it is the right time if you're an investor that understands uh, what the potential timeline for a financial return would be for you and that there is a potential outcome where you get nothing. Um, I think that generally my answer is yes, there's always a VC that uh, could potentially make an investment in quantum right now. And Tomer, how about you? What do you, what do you reckon? Jason, I think that the reality speaks for itself. We've seen over the last two, uh, last two years a growing number of investments following into the uh, evolving quantum technology industry coming from governments, from venture capitalists, from private investors. And uh, as you mentioned in the beginning of this call, we just crossed half a billion dollars, which clearly indicates now is the time. The question is where should capital flow and what companies should we invest in? Right. Um, and Thomas, your view? Well, at Airbus Ventures, we first invested in 2016, just literally a few months after we were created. And then uh, from software, moved to hardware in 2019. And, and I would say, as venture capitalists, we're not here to try to be smarter than quantum physicists and answer the question to just the deck. But as venture capitalists, we want to look at other elements. Is there a critical mass of investors around the table to efficiently syndicate the risk? And I think the answer to that question is pretty clear. The answer is yes. So to that extent, this is a VC moment just by the nature of, of race syndication uh, around complex technologies, in my opinion. Right. Um, now, Andrew, I've, I've saved you for last um, deliberately because I, I know that you have a view on this. You say you, uh, you wrote a, an influential blog post in 2016 that said, uh, that said and essentially had some, some reservations about that and that you largely stand by that even now. In a general sense, obviously, everybody on the panel thinks it's time for them to be investing. But in the in a general sense, do you think it's a time for 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 venture capital to, to pile in? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, and that piece, uh, you know, was titled "Is it time for venture capitalists to put chips on the table?" And uh, and and I pretty much stand by exactly what I said, you know, four years ago. So um, in some ways, a lot has changed in the space, in that a lot of people have decided yes, it is time to put chips on the table. But in some ways, you know, the risk return, uh, well, we're further down, you know, further down the track, further down the curve now has stayed kind of, you know, if you zoom out far enough, roughly the same, right? I mean, I think Margaret said it's a pretty binary bet, right? You know, it's a moonshot, you know, and, and if you don't succeed, like there may be a little bit of salvage value, but it's not going to be a lot. But if you do succeed, right, the size of this prize is pretty, is pretty massive. And so to me, it's just a question of, of, you know, pure statistical expected value, right? What is the probability of success times the size of the prize? And if that equation works out, right, to you know a greater amount, you know, than what you're what you're investing, 
then I think, you know, if you, if you roll the dice enough times, right, a thousand times, you know, construct a portfolio, you should come out ahead. And so I think, um, you know, to the point of some, some of my colleagues here, yes, it's definitely a, a really interesting time in the space. It's a d- dynamic time in the space. You're starting to see, you know, some companies pull ahead of the pack, right? Um, but as Dave Wineland says, right, we're, you know, this is a marathon and we're, we're still able to kind of look over our shoulder and see the starting line. So, you know, while there are a few leaders kind of kind of emerging and, and, you know, I think it's it's great that we're seeing some some really nice success and development. You still have to be willing, right, to to make this bet as part of a thoughtfully constructed portfolio. This is not a bet the farm kind of a situation, right? It's absolutely not a sure thing. Um, any given player, right, there's certain risks and nuances associated with their approach. So I, I certainly agree that. It's a very interesting uh, market to play in. We've, t- you know, we've made some investments in, in the category. We certainly are believers, right, that this could be a transformative technology, and it's a it's a moonshot worth taking. Right. So broadly, yes, with with not a whole lot of qualifications, it seems. But um, it occurs to me also that this is a space where lots and lots of governments are piling in. This is this is a technology with a lot of strategic implications at sort of state level. And I'm wondering how much uh, the, the interplay with the, 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 the big players um, in, in the space being actual state governments affects the equation, affects the sort of uh, the rules of the dice as, as Andrew describes it. Um, uh, let's go to you, Thomas. What, what's your view on, on the, the presence of big government money kind of being part of all of this? Well, that's that's a fact. I think, Jason, you're right. There's there's this notion of of government play. There's this notion of sovereignty. Uh, there's the element of national security involved, and and one may think about military application and potentially even some element of dominance. So obviously, there's there's a dark way to look at all of that, but there's also a bright way to look at that, which is it's an opportunity for collaboration among states, amongst nations, in a way that it's actually creating a booster to the quantum development. There is a, I agree with Andrew, I think uh, we're still at the very beginning of the story, but as a matter of fact, the level of appetite for people using, testing, understanding element of quantum uh, stack and quantum technology as, as just increasingly, uh, it's, it's increasingly there around us in, in the last four years. So, and government is no exception. So I think it's a force we need to recognize. We need to be able to leverage uh, it is not trivial. I would say playing private public money is is a different game, but I think it's an interesting one if we can navigate it. Right. Yeah, and to, to add on to what uh, Thomas said, right? I mean, going back to, to your comment, Jason, around the Academy of Sciences and, and their their statement that you know there are no known applications. There's a there's a nuance to that statement, right? The nuance is there are known no known applications that exist today. But there are absolutely well-defined theoretical applications for a computer, a quantum computer of a certain size, you know, in the future. And so there's a there's a bit of a nuance there. We absolutely know where you know certain um, possible applications lie, you know, even to the you know even to the level of detail of saying exactly which industries, exactly you know which use cases, you know, if we had a quantum computer of a certain level of performance, you know, could impact from a, from a business sense. So there is a little bit of a nuance there. I definitely think, you know, to your question around government, it's a very interesting moment in time because we see like two kind of diametrically opposed approaches in kind of the, the, the West and East, right? If you look at the way China is funding quantum computing, you know, they've taken sort of a, you know, a Manhattan project or a Bletchley Park style approach, pouring $10 billion into a very specific center, you know, with the specific set of scientists working down a few different approaches, but all kind of in concert. Whereas if you look at the West, you know, whether you're looking at kind of EU or US, right, respectively, both governments have pledged about a billion dollars to the, the general development of quantum information science and quantum computing, but the approach couldn't be more different. It's very much a, a spread out your bet approach, right? Small grants to a wide swath of companies. And, you know, hopefully one of those companies will succeed. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's hard to say what, which approach is, is going to work. But if you just look to history, for an example, you know, if you look at whether it's the Manhattan Project, Bletchley Park, you know, the, the, the space race, right, there have been certain benefits to concentrating, you know, government resources in a, in a smaller number of projects that look to have a higher likelihood of success. So it'll be very interesting to see 
you know, how that plays out on, on the global stage. And I'm not saying the approach in the West is incorrect. I'm saying, you know, it might be incomplete, right? Phase one maybe uh, makes sense to spread out bets and, and watch as they kind of evolve. And then maybe phase two is to concentrate additional resources behind the ones that are emerging as winners. So well, I, mean, I, that, you know, I think that, it, it, that, that, that may be ahead. pretty much uh, every, everybody, sorry to interrupt. Um, that may be in fact, everybody's uh, uh, approach in, and uh, there's several things to pick up on there uh, in, in terms of moving the discussion on. Um, in particular, the sort of the theoretical existence of uh, use cases and applications and so on. I mean, that, that is a sort of core facet of this entire industry is on paper, it looks good. This entire industry has been an, has been a, um, an opportunity that has looked good on paper for, you know, uh, depending on where you count it starting, but at least 30 years. And I just wonder uh, the, the, the degree to which, um, for instance, all of these uh, software companies, for example, that say, once we get there, well, on principle, once we get there, we'll be able to do this. There's that all of this uncertainty um, about exactly how to get there, but a, a crazy amount of seeming certainty that we will. Um, and we can break this up into a discussion about both both hardware and, and software, but I'm, I'm interested to know also about this notion of spreading the bets. Um, let's start with hardware on, on the spreading the bets issue. The biggest discussion um, going on on the hardware side is which of the actual platforms will first make it to quantum advantage. Um, and I don't know uh, between you how many of you thinks that think that is a, a, a winner takes all proposition. Do you believe that a, uh, a particular platform, if it proves itself useful earlier, uh, first past the post kind of thing, that that's going to essentially close down other platforms or simply uh, simply just sort of become one with a bit of commercial advantage for a bit while others catch up. Um, Margo, do you have a, a view on that? I think that you're right. It's the dominant view that a winner is going to take all, but I have a bit of a contrarian uh, point of view because there are a few different approaches, namely those based on continuous variables that will solve a different set of problems. Um, and beyond that, between similar hardware approaches, if one is able to reach universal fault tolerance first, we can't predict how quickly there may be fast followers or whether or not factors of scalability and access that have played out in the ecosystem will come into play in terms of timelines for full market dominance. Well, uh, the the invocation of uh, fault tolerant computer kind of splits us again on on the sort of on the decision tree. I mean, uh, I'm kind of uh, you've you've uh, told me that, that there are a couple of philosophies, right? That essentially nothing's worth pursuing except to get to the fault tolerance because everything else is kind of messing around, uh, messing around in in sort of lesser capability. Um, and I would imagine that everybody, uh, most people on, on the panel here believe that uh, the era that we're in, the sort of scrappy machines that we have, the, the so-called noisy intermediate scale machines will bring plenty of value. And the, the eventual, you know, uh, general computer, the fault tolerant one will be a good to have when the time comes and uh, indeed bring about new applications. But uh, I mean, Tomer, what, what's your view on uh, the, the the degree to which the NISC era will bring enough value to keep all of this going, uh, the degree to which it's foolhardy perhaps to aim only for, to, to, to wipe all of this away and wait only for fault tolerance? Jason, I think the NISC era is, is going to be an important period in the development of quantum computers. Um, if we look at the last two decades, Humanity has always looked at the physical components of the universe in order to build uh, stronger and more efficient computing systems. And it's only reasonable that as we approach the limits of Moore's law, that we seek other opportunities to further scale up our computers. And quantum, compu quantum mechanics do represent the nature of the universe much better than classical. Now, the path toward the fault tolerant computer is going to be a long, treacherous, and a difficult to predict one. Um, it might take a few years, it might take a, day, take a decade or two. But if you look back at humanity's approaches to developing technology, you would always see that there has been a gradual shift uh, towards new technologies that came about in multiple spots. Um, I think that within quantum computing, we've already seen a few of them. Uh, the early emergence of quantum annealing systems, followed by the early emergence of uh, very faulty, very small scale systems. Uh, but over the next decade, I expect that we'll see a growing number of, of operational machines 
operating at uh, higher degrees of fault tolerance and also um, larger amounts of, of qubits. Now, you also asked about the prevailing modality for quantum advantage, for which I have an obvious question, uh, an, an obvious answer. It's, it's going to be superconducting qubits. When you look at the amount of capital spent on this modality alone across Google, IBM, Rigetti, and many, many others, uh, you, you can see how it far eclipses the amount of capital that was spent in other modalities. Now, whether it would be a winner take all economy or not is tough to say. And I think there is a real chance that other emerging modalities will come up with a set of pros and cons compared to superconducting qubits when it comes down to the specs. But the first demonstration of quantum advantage is very likely going to be on superconducting based systems. Um, I would like to throw that one out to the floor because that is uh, that, that is a provocative suggestion. Anyone else have a thought as to uh, there being an obvious winner as regards a, a platform? Just want to add something, Jason, if I may, on kind of, you know, calling the winner right now at a time where I think the the answer of the ultimate computers and and capability, if I relate to the aerospace industry, for instance, uh, we we start seeing having a clear sense that they should be more than quantum in the answer. By that, I mean, there is complementary element and solutions, systems and hardware that would come from, you know, all the kind of revolution, the DNA computing revolution, uh, for just to quote one, could could definitely bring some element and answers and and patch some of the uh, weaknesses of the NISC system or the almost ultimate system that we may see coming up. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I think time will tell. Uh, I, I love Tomer enthusiasm about superconductivity. I, I think he's, he's got a great point. I'm not sure the correlation with the amount of money is necessarily uh, and always true. Uh, it could be. Uh, but it's also fairly possible that creativity and disruption in this industry uh, will will surprise us also. So just want to bring a different perspective here. Yeah, I totally I, agree I just, with Thomas on that one. Um, I, just to draw an analogy, right, Thomas, you made a comparison to the aerospace industry, right? If you were to look at the development of kind of, you know, long haul, um, you know, air travel in like the first few decades of the 1900s, you know, you'd say, oh, it's clear, right, that, you know, propeller planes are going to be the winner, right? If you just look at the capital that's flowing in and, you know, the current state of affairs, but you would be wrong. Um, and so I disagree with the notion that the amount of capital flowing into a given category is necessarily a good predictor of where that category will ultimately end up from a capability standpoint. And so, you know, obviously, um, you know, I've, I've made a bet in, uh, in trapped ion quantum computing, right? And there are a bunch of reasons for that which, uh, you know, we don't have to get into in depth, but I think qubit quality is probably, um, you know, the best summary for, 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 for why. And if you look at kind of, um, you know, across pretty much any dimension you want, right, purity of qubits, coherence time, the ability to connect qubits, not just one to one or one to four, but all to all, you know, you have these inherent advantages in trapped ions, right? And they, and they scale. And so, I mean, I think, uh, I think it's very, very hard at this phase to, to say that, you know, for example, superconducting is going to be the winner. Just if you look at IBM's quantum volume metric alone, right, a trapped ion computer, you know, ion cues uh, machine uh, is by far, you know, the most performant computer today. And so I think it's, you know, it's, it's risky to call a winner, but I, but I, but I also think, um, you know, there, there are certainly uh, avenues beyond, beyond superconducting that show a lot of promise today. I should probably stop things there because we could go down a very deep hole. But Margaret, I, I, I can tell you've got you've got one thing to add to this. Sure. No? Just that I think Tamara is saying that to be a devil's advocate or something, because there's no way any of us can tell right now at this point in time which approach is going to be dominant. And I go back to my initial comment where, uh, you know, there are other factors that come into play, even if one of these approaches reaches fault tolerance first. And there are devices and algorithms that we can envision in the NISC era that are, again, mainly from the continuous variable side that cannot be simulated by a fault tolerant computer. So I do think there is some intermediary phase where we have multiple uh, machines providing a value proposition to various users. I'm, I'm keenly aware that we, we shouldn't get into the um, who's going to win on the hardware side or indeed on, on the software side. Um, and uh, I mean, that's a, perhaps a, a, a 
what a lot of the rest of the conference will be talking about. Um, but let's bring it back to to your your actual day jobs here, rather than sort of uh, making uh, engineering propositions. Um, and what interests me about this is is kind of where all of this sits on the hype cycle. The fact that this discussion arose around w which. Uh, which platform is going to come up with solutions and the um, ease of reaching them and so on. Um, I'm a little worried about hype, and I have been from from the very start in looking into quantum technology, um, and I've drawn uh, an analogy uh, of sorts with uh, with the AI winter, right, where essentially uh, AI went went dark for quite some time because it basically didn't live up to the expectations because there wasn't an alignment of applications and technology in in the right way and you know, the, the bottom fell out of it for a long time. Now, now, now things are back, but that is something that the quantum technology world wants very much to avoid. And I'm just kind of wondering how you think about, um, how you think about, uh, making good guesses about, about those use cases, about the, the, the addition to the bottom line, um, taking those kinds of risks in, in the certainty that use cases won't be as many as many people say, that the hardware won't come to fruition as quick as many people say. This is, there is a risk, a collective one rather than an individual one, that we take ourselves down the, the Gartner hype cycle to a, a trough of disillusionment. Um, let's say, uh, Andrew, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think that we absolutely have the recipe for a, a classic hype cycle here, and the antidote to that is realigning expectations on timeline. So I think if people make investments in the space and expect to see very quick results, you know, we could end up in a hype cycle situation that poisons the well in quantum. A lot of people may sour on the space, and it will take you know, like an a, like the AI comparison is is apt. It'll take another five or ten years before people you know dive back in again. That said, if today, you know, investors in the category look at the space with an appropriate level of patience, I think the hype cycle can be avoided. Right. Thomas, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I want to react. Uh, Andrew used a key word. I think patience here is the name of the game. As early stage investor, you build the patience in the model of your fund. Uh, when you have a 10 year cycle, you know that the investment in year one is not meant to yield result in year two. That's not how it's built. So I think we, we have time ahead of us to, to start seeing the, the promise unfolding or not. But I, I, I want to testify for kind of from the industry perspective a little bit. And, and, and I can tell you that in the aerospace sector, the, the number of use cases and ideas and exploration that are ahead of us, I mean, it's, it's exciting. And there is so much work that I don't see any element of winter you know, uh, altering that or, or stopping that dynamic. Uh, I mean, be it the, the, the redesign of wind box and section of aircraft to CFD computation that could be uh, started uh, with whatever computing, computing power and computers are available today, uh, give enough of element uh, and confidence that we're not going to get into this big moment of there's nothing. You promise me everything and there is nothing. I, I don't believe in this binary outcome. I'd rather believe it's a journey, and uh, and this journey is just getting exciting, and people will get on it. So, uh, I'm pretty positive on that. So, no hype cycle uh, in my in my perspective. Right. Um, be, because I'm so hung up on this, I, I do want to hear from everybody um, about about that point. Tomer, Tomer, what's your view about the the risk of hype? I think we've got to look at two different segments here: the hardware segment versus the software segment. Within the hardware, it seems to me unavoidable that consolidation would come in the next few years. Uh, there are currently a few dozen early stage companies uh, working alongside some of the biggest tech corporates in the world, trying to pursue the development of quantum technology. And all of us agree that, or at least I would assume that all of us agree that at the end of the day, there aren't going to be a few dozen different quantum computers on the market. There are likely going to be fewer then. Um, and, and so there is a question of when consolidation would take place and in what fashion. It might be that companies will fail to raise additional capital and would have to go through a difficult shutdown process. And it might be that we'll see a series of mergers and acquisitions where big tech corporates that do not currently have a bet in the space acquire several smaller companies in order to build up their own strategies and compete with the other big tech uh, corporates. Um, and then on the software side, I feel like the amount of capital flowing towards software right now is still fairly limited. And it does match to a pretty good degree the expected timelines of hardware development. Uh, to the extent that we'll start seeing significant capital flowing towards the software side of things, especially in the next year or two, when things are still fairly immature, that could pose the 
potential for uh, winter, as, as you called it. Uh, but I think that right now we're in a pretty good space. Uh, we're in a pretty good space too. And that the amount of capital that flows towards software is appropriate. Um, so I'd say that things are okay right now and hopefully they stay that way. Right. Margaret, anything to, to add on this? My, my, my pet subject? I generally agree with everybody. Uh, this is definitely a marathon, not a sprint. And as long as investors and potential customers understand that, we're you know, above the innovation trigger, but not close to the peak of inflated expectations yet. And companies that can't sustain continued development through algorithms or hardware won't be able to get funding and will na naturally let some air out. So I also agree with Tamara that I think if any area of investment is going to cause some type of backlash uh, or a bit of a bubble, it is around software, not in terms of uh, work on algorithms or firmware as it relates to the hardware, but, you know, middleware uh, and, and anything that is being, um, created agnostic to hardware, uh, they're, they're going to have a hard time because they have no idea what they're building for yet. They don't know which of these hardware approaches is going to come through. So how are they going to commercially sustain themselves? I, I don't know. Right. Um, that leads on, I suppose, quite neatly to the question that a lot of people uh, who are attending this session will probably be um, thinking about. I imagine there are quite a few entrepreneurs um, and and want to hear from from VCs about this. So this, this is kind of the uh, some some home truths and lessons for for entrepreneurs out there. I'm just looking to find out what kind of um, the good and the bad that you see in startups. Um, the sort of is there a, a commonality in the kinds of mistakes, the kinds of shortcomings, the kinds of failure of vision in the startups that you that you deal with? Um, let's say Andrew. Sure. Um, so I mean, I think there's I think there's a, a couple of ways you could unpack that, right? Like if you look at um, across the landscape of startups, you have uh, a few different modalities, right? You've got people with, uh, you know, leading companies with a bit more of a business background. You've got people with a pure physics background. I think the ideal team needs to have a little bit of both. And so certainly looking for that or thinking about that appropriately in phases is a very uh, key, important and, and key point when making an investment, right? You may be great with a pure technical leader during the first phase of the company, but to the extent the market opportunity starts approaching the company a little bit more quickly you may need to transition to a phase where you've got you know a technology savvy but commercial leader at the helm of that company so that's something i'd be paying close attention to you know i mentioned before a little bit around timeline i think it's very important to have patience and, and make sure that when you're looking at companies milestones you know you you as an investor build in a little bu bit of buffer right in your expectations i think that's critical when looking at when looking at companies don't assume that they're going to hit every single milestone the exact day that they that they say they will. Um, things may happen faster. Things may may happen more slowly. And then at the other, you know, maybe to to tack on to Margaret's point a little bit, um, there may be some interesting commercial traction in the early days, especially around software and consulting. But I think to to sustain yourself long term, there needs to be a real long term business model and uh, and hopefully competitive advantage, which may stem from hardware. Right. Um, we are running a bit short on time. So, uh, and I do want to, to get um, everyone's view here if, if possible. Um, Thomas, what, what do you think? What, what, what are the, the, the pitfalls that you see a lot happening among startups? Well, very short then. Uh, I mean, to me, the, the more complex the technology, usually uh, the less diverse the team end up being, because you, you want to get this, this common language across the team and you, you kind of miss this element of true diversity that you need, the diversity of mindset that needs to be there. Exactly what Andrew said, business to science, science, technology, technology to market. So there's this balance to find that often is lost when you go too deep in tech. Right. Tomer, briefly. It is only natural for uh, QC companies to compare themselves to other QC companies. I'd encourage them, especially when speaking with investors, to compare themselves to more traditional companies like SaaS companies or enterprise software at the end of the day, it's capital flowing either to QC or to other categories, not necessarily to which company within the QC sector. Right, fair enough. And Margaret, to, to close, just a brief thought. Uh, I think the funny thing is that whatever we say as non-technical investors, maybe the shortcomings of quantum computing startups are usually the inverse of what they say are uh, 
our shortcomings as investors. So there, the culture fit between investors and entrepreneurs in this space is difficult. Um, but what I see from companies uh, is really that they're either on two sides of the same coin. They're either too focused on revenue now and you're not going to be a quantum computing company. You're going to end up being a consulting or AI company or you're not focused enough on the go to market or the path to commercialization. Right. Um, Thomas, Tomer, Andrew, Margaret, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for, for watching out there, the audience. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thanks, Jason.